Hello there, this is Aaron Osborne, the host of the Oblivious Maximus podcast. On my podcast, I chat to people about music and specifically records they really like. Andy was kind enough recently to come on and have a chat, and I've previously had guests from bands like Psychroptic, Cosmic Psychos, Violent Soho, Nails, and people from all walks of life who love talking about music. Head to obliviousmaximus.net for more info or search for Oblivious Maximus podcast wherever you get your podcasts or on social media. Brutal! Welcome back to the Andy Social Podcast. It's your mate, Andy. I'm back. I've got another episode for you, but before we kick into it, Patreon. That's right. You know what I'm going to say. Patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. It is the best, the best way to support this podcast. And support starts from only a buck a month. Dirt cheap, set and forget. You won't even notice it. And there are additional tiers there if you're interested in the exclusive Patreon-only podcast episode that comes out every Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. Sydney time, in your ear holes. Gives you a little bit of a spring in your step, brightens your day, gets you through the week, and it's all over at patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. All the money that comes out of Patreon goes straight back into this podcast, production, gear, editing, hosting, all the costs that come into uh, doing podcasts, and uh, you guys are a massive, massive help to keep all this stuff fueled and chugging along. So go and check it all out, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Cheers. Welcome back to the Andy Social Podcast, episode 252, and we've got a return guest, Lachlan Watt. Lachlan hasn't been on the podcast for fucking ages. I think it was uh, episode 84, I think, from what I can recall. Um, and yeah, we had a chat a few weeks ago and spoke about his latest metal project run with Mike from High Tension. Um, they've got an EP out now called For You Will Never Find Peace Within Your Quiet, and I staggered that out because... That's their track listing. It goes from track one to track five. For you, we'll never find peace within your quiet. Pretty cool. Uh, so we spoke about that. We spoke about uh, the the new release, the project, and sort of the the OG around it all. Uh, we spoke a bit about uh, the fucking roller coaster ride that Lachlan's been going through over the past couple of years. Just like fucking insane. Um, if you know Lachlan, you'll know you'll know what he's been through. So I won't uh, harp on about that. But uh, we talk about a bit of that in this conversation and. Uh, and yeah, just talk a bit of bit of shit, and uh, he's just an absolute legend. Um, I've really got a lot of time for Lachlan. Um, hardly see him. Um, both Brizzy boys, both Briz metal boys from back in the day, and uh, we're both li- living in different cities these days. And um, it's just great to connect. And hopefully, it won't be too long before we cross paths in the future. But uh, go and check out Run by going to runmetal.bandcamp.com, facebook.com slash runmetal. I'll put uh, all the links to everything in the show notes over at andysocial.net or andydaling.net. Of course, you can go and check out Lachlan on The Racket as well on Triple J. He's been there for fuck a few years now. Actually, I'm pretty sure on episode 84, um, he'd only been doing it for a few years, I think, or he'd only just, I can't remember. Anyway, why am I even trying to recall this? Enough yapping on from me. Please enjoy this great chat with the legend himself, Lachlan Watt. part of my life from pretty early on and I guess it was probably about five years ago uh, in Melbourne I uh, started sort of I got some rescue chooks of my own down here because I kind of had a a backyard suitable enough for them and uh, had a few chooks basically following me around ever since until I had to move into a a one-bedroom apartment for my um, cancer treatment and then I you know had to rehome the chickens I had in the t- at the time, there was only a few of them. But uh, yeah, since moving out to this new place, like in this post-pandemic world, I've been you know, going pretty nuts with it. I think we've got about uh, 12, 13 chooks at the moment. Oh, I've seen, I've seen uh, you've even started uh, commercialising your chooks as well. <laughs> uh, not, not exactly. I think <laughs> I'd like to do that eventually. But for the time being, it's just, uh, you know, hooking up my friends with uh, eggs or whatever here and there, like sometimes someone will buy me a coffee in exchange for them or something. Like people have offered to pay, but for now I'm just happy to kind of provide some stuff for my friends and myself. It's good. I was going to say, I mean, they're better better to go to a good home than just go to waste because I assume that they uh, they probably churn out a few eggs fairly often. Yeah, we get, we're getting about six or seven a day. So yeah, constantly packing up six packs to hand around. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, I think um, I haven't really appreciated um, the avian variety for, well, I I don't think I ever have until probably in the last few years when uh, Jess and I got a cockatiel and pretty much 
the world has changed forever. Like it, now I'm just this bird freak. I just love them. And I'm, I'm like freaking out when I see pigeons. I'm like, like waving to them when I go for my walks. I'm like, oh, hey, how you going? Morning. You know, just dumb shit. But um, I've just got this appreciation for, <laughs> for the avian species now. Yeah, um, my partner Kelly, she's got a um, a lorikeet named Dexter. He's like seven or eight years old or something. Um, so he hangs out with the chooks sometimes too, and he's, he's pretty cool. Uh, we've got all sorts of native birds around out here now because I'm we're, I'm living out in um, near Belgrave, sort of out in the Dandenong Ranges, and uh, it's just kind of a bird paradise. Like in my backyard, I'm seeing black cock black mm-hmm. cockatoos and. Um, we had some galahs visit for the first time this morning, mm, a whole sorry. bunch of rosellas and a couple of king parrots that are kind of hanging around and don't have to go too fast, kind of, you know, I, you know, seen some lyrebirds on my walks through the bush and stuff, and yeah, it's amazing. I love birds. It must, I mean, you must be in the perfect spot for everything that's happened this year. Like, if anybody, like, you know, with all the lockdowns and everything that's been going on, I mean, you could have been stuck in that tiny little apartment, but uh, instead you've, you've got this space you know, obviously not yeah. ideal, but, um, you know, if you're going to be anywhere, I mean, it's probably, probably a really good spot. Yeah. Um, I was actually a couple of weeks before the pandemic, uh, the reality of the pandemic sort of, uh, made itself clear to me. I'd actually just signed on for another year at, uh, the apartment because I was sort of expecting to return to a life of gigging and touring and going to shows all the time and stuff. Um, but, uh, been seeing my partner Kelly for, uh, you know, probably like six or seven months or something at that point. And I, she had a place out here and it, um, the pandemic hit and everything went to shit. And I'm like, oh, I'm cancelling this lease. Sorry. Keep the bond, whatever. See you later. Uh, I'm moving out to the bush. And I'm so kind of, kind of glad it's sort of, it, it's worked out so, so well. I don't want to say I'm glad the pandemic happened or whatever, but like I feel that it is in, in a strange way kind of blessed me with a, amazing new life that, you know, I probably would have wanted or arrived at in the long run, but I wasn't really, didn't think I was ready for it yet, you know? Did you, like, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you questions and I'm pretty sure I know the answers just because I've been watching your commentary for, <laughs> for the past year or so, <laughs> but, and just you sort of going on this roller coaster ride, but um, no doubt, like the last several months for you, like your identity and where you fit into the world and you know as you said before sort of prepping for what you thought would be sort of you know the the coming months and years of touring and doing whatever you need to do in that music space and that obviously getting thrown out the window have you found that sort of the way that you look at life now just due to the circumstances is just completely different like and even the way that you identify yourself as a musician that's potentially changed as well yeah man it's um it's kind of, you know, like I've had some really dark moments in this pandemic, even since moving out to the, the bush here. Um, it's, it hasn't been exactly a 100% sort of perfect adjustment period or anything. It's, um, you know, I think everyone's had some pretty hard times with this. And then especially with us in Melbourne being locked down mm. second time and just having, you know, freedoms perpetually kind of pushed further and further away. Um, but the last kind of month or so I've, arrived at a really like comfortable, happy sort of spot and understanding with everything and just a, an acceptance of things. Like I kind of, you know, really wanted to hold on to the idea of, you know, being a touring musician and a, and a promoter and whatnot. Not that, you know, those things won't happen at, you know, some point again in the future. Um, it just, you know, I guess my, yeah, my priorities have, have shifted a bit and I've actually found more inner peace i guess uh just doing organic kind of farmy sort of stuff and just hanging out here with someone i love every day as opposed to you know burning myself out on the road and just you know there's there's really good things and really bad things about the the tour lifestyle and i think i've experienced both of them both sort of angles in pretty equal kind of regard but um like you know most sort of touring people especially people that you know like to drink i guess <laughs> yeah experience um, but yeah, I, it, I don't feel the, the same urgency. I don't even like, I don't feel the same sort of need to like prove myself. Mm. I guess I kind of had this kind of desire to, you know, especially after doing the, 
you know, the, the fill-in replacement singer thing for so long and then coming up with my own band and getting to a point where I'd finally had a sick release that I believed in that was 100% me, that I was able to do what I wanted with. Um, yeah, it was a bit hard to sort of, I guess, let go of that initially, but uh, I've just kind of accepted that I don't really need to – I'm lucky that I got to have all those experiences because so many people won't ever again and like the music scene is just going to not uh, recover completely for a long time, if, if at all, I don't think. And, uh, you know, just, I don't know, I think, feel like I've gone on a few tangents here and I'm rambling a bit, but uh, correct me if I'm going off course, but yeah, I just uh, <laughs> feel um, feel really satisfied with where I am and I'm kind of becoming happier every day to sort of let go of my old goals and dreams in life. Well, um, I'll say right now, you go off on as many tangents as you want because that's that's the the name of the game with podcasting. It makes my job yeah. easier. <laughs> but I, I mean, oh, totally. I mean, for I think just in my space compared to yours, I think you certainly took a path where you went more in, uh, a, like you threw everything into it. I think you and just your nature and just at least from the outside looking in. You, you throw yourself into everything that you do, whether it be good or yep. bad. And I think for from my point of view, I've, I think probably just out of the environment that I've been in from a band perspective where we haven't got guys who are full-time guys anymore. And so we've had to balance other things in life. So we've tried to maintain, you know, the musician identity, but then having to sort of fill the gaps with everything else. So if yep. anything, as bad as it sounds, we were sort of better prepped for this period of time that's just, that, that we're in and we're sort of getting through at the moment than others that have, you know, basically thrown absolutely everything into it themselves. So it's, um, but at the same time, like for me, I, I've, I've always struggled with, you know, what, what is the hat that I'm wearing? Like, what is the identity of me and sort of what is the future and sort of this year sort of seeing everything sort of gets ext extinguished in watching a lot of mates sort of just, just like staring at a wall going, fuck, oh, I don't even know what I'm going to do now. It's sort of like, yeah. it's a, it's a very weird thing to, to have to experience because you, I think everybody's sort of looking inside themselves to try and work out, okay, well, what, what does this all mean? Sort of factually just, you know, what's ahead of me, but also just in life in general, like where, where do I sit in the grand scheme of things? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I completely recognize the fact too, that I'm ex extremely privileged and lucky to, you know, have even had the opportunity to be able to just pick up and leave the city and move out to where I am now. And, um, you know, I wasn't relying on my band for an income, you know? Um, and so that there's a lot of friends of mine who are just, uh, still probably having a bit of a tough time with, with that, not being able to tour, not really relying on their traditional source of income and having to kind of look at new, new paths and, try and find themselves again I, I kind of feel like i got pretty lucky with how easily it, the sort of um next stage of my life i guess unfolded before me mm. is it it must be i mean i think you sort of mentioned it before it must like just even in the last few weeks of you sort of having a little bit more peace that must be just a weight off your shoulders even if you don't have clarity of where where the future leads at least having sort of that understanding of right here right now this is this is all yeah. i need to worry about yeah i think i um kind of like you know you accept that you're not where you thought you would be or where i am but where i am is pretty bloody sweet and then all of a sudden it's like don't feel so much um concern don't feel so concerned about what comes next like i've still got you know goals and aspirations for everything i'm i'm doing out here and like always working on upgrading the sort of farms and little angles around the house and becoming more and more self-sufficient. So I, I've still got goals and things, but they're, I guess, uh, quite different. <laughs> they're not what you were expecting uh, a couple of years ago yeah. anyway. Yeah. And, but, um, I've just sort of, you know, especially after cancer and everything, like it, that changed my perspective on a lot of things too, because that's another thing that took away, uh, what I thought I'd be doing during that whole period of, you know, making a record and touring and not, you know, sitting around recovering from brain surgery and going through chemotherapy and blah, blah. So I sort of had a, 
a one-two hit of nut, nut, and everything still worked out great. Um, and I'm probably, yeah, more, more at peace and have more inner happiness than I ever have before. So just uh, roll with it. Yeah, oh, fucking, yeah, definitely. I mean, I this might be a really weird thing to say, but do you think that just going through all the cancer stuff, if oh, – I'm not going to word this right, so bear with me, but do you think that it sort of prepped you a little bit for all the COVID stuff that happened because you'd sort of gone through this yes. roller coaster before the next one rolled around? Yeah, no, I've um, I've said this a few times to some people, like in conversation and whatnot. Um, I, I think I it put me in a position where I was ready to accept a brutal, harsh truth that was unavoidable. And so I feel like, because, you know, for a, a while, I think people, you know, there's lots of hoo-ha on the internet about coronavirus, like for months before we were all actually properly hit by it and, and everyone sort of gradually came to terms with what was going on. I feel like I was probably like three or four weeks ahead of most people I know in terms of coming to, well, in just coming to terms with it. And yeah, I think a big part of that was perhaps that I'd already had a kind of similar experience with the cancer diagnosis because it's just like when the scientists are telling you something and you're just like, yep, all right, that's it. Things are different. It's just going to be heavy. <laughs> and you just have to, again, roll with it. Sort of getting that acceptance early in the piece rather than sort of resisting for a longer period of time, just putting you through, putting yourself through more anguish before finally you've got yeah. no choice but to accept it. Yeah, totally. And and even with the, you know, the lifestyle of a cancer patient, like, you know, I, I still kind of squeezed in as much sort of partying as I could throughout the, um, the radiation therapy, but you can't really do that with the chemo. So my social life was pretty sort of limited already and I hadn't been, you know, working for most of the year already. So yeah, there's several angles as to how cancer sort of better prepared me to just uh, hit the ground running a little bit more when COVID happened. Uh, I get the, I get the feeling or the, the vibe from you that, you know, you're certainly somebody that throws themselves out in the public domain and you've got an opinion and you, and you sort of throw it all out there without sort of a lot of hesitation, at least from my point of view. But you, I think yep. you're definitely an introvert. Would I be right? Like as far as sort of the underlying sort of core part of your personality? Yeah, I think so. Um, I get, yeah, I guess it's just a, a weird mix. I don't know. Depends uh, on depends on the, the circumstances, I guess. Yeah, I feel there's some things I have to be really out, outspoken about, um, and I, I also feel like you know the internet isn't quite real life, and it, it's obviously much easier to be more outspoken on the internet. Um, but but generally, um, yeah, I haven't. Uh, I, I, even since lock, lockdown sort of has, has, has eased, I, cause you know, I've kept up with a, most of my, well, all my friends really through just the internet this whole time. And I'm not as concerned about getting back out there into social spaces and, and busy things. Like not that I, you know, have like an extreme social anxiety or, or anything, but I think after living like this for so long, it's, um, it's definitely become a little bit more of a daunting prospect. Like went to some markets, uh, the other week um, and just the amount of people there was uh, kind of intimidating, to be honest. Yeah. And um, yeah, it is it is nice living living out here in the bush and uh, not having to sort of see too many other people. I I guess I sometimes the internet is my preferred sort of medium of expression. Mm. I I get the feeling that sort of it, even with the the cancer stuff, you're sort of forced to as you said like when you you could no longer just go out and hang out with people you've you've sort of been forced to your own company or very limited company as far as the people that you can associate with so you know just purely out of no other choice you sort of had to really sort of get used to and and you know try to enjoy the most of your own your own space rather than trying to find that validation or that excitement or pleasure or whatever it is externally and i've always been um I've always sort of been really, I don't know, just, just, it's just my natural kind of instinct, I, I think, is to, to be pretty independent. And, you know, I like to often work on projects by myself. Like, I love teamwork when it works, but um, I, 
I, uh, yeah, I, I just really like to sort of take, take control of my sort of, uh, endeavors wholeheartedly myself. I just, yeah, I don't know. That's just how it is for me. Does, um, I think there's, I was reading one of the interviews that you did a few months back. I can't remember which one it was, but, um, you were going through track by track for your EP and I think it was yep. the song we'll never, and you'll, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to correct me here, but, uh, more than likely from what, I, from what I can see, I think you were speaking about identity purpose and, and the plans and the things that we we're t- talking about a little bit earlier on. Is that, yep. is that sort of the core of what? that song in particular? Cause I think when I was looking through sort of the um, progression of the songs, that one sort of stuck out quite a bit, especially with what's been going on for yourself and everywhere. Yeah. For everyone. I think, I think that's, um, that's definitely where, it, where it ended up. But that song originally came from, well, because Mike and I had sort of already been writing the, the record for a few months at the time when my seizure happened. Um, but that was the, we sort of, cause we had a framework for everything and we had this five track record. And even though that's track two, we, we knew what track two was, but we hadn't really gotten stuck in. We hadn't found the riff. We hadn't found the lyrical kind of drive for it yet. And then my seizure happened and we, we, we'd written all the rest. My seizure happened. I ended up in hospital. Um, and it's like, Hey, there's a tumor in your brain. And, um, then that's just, it just came from there. And yeah, I guess that, uh, that song was just really about reevaluating your standing with everything when you're faced with your own mortality and how quickly it can change. Do you find that with yourself being in that position, which, yeah, okay, there's a lot of people that, you know, do suffer and, and go through tragedy and, and either come out the other side or they don't. But I think just if you're with your everyday Joe Blow, who doesn't really experience a lot of pain and hardship, do you, sort of observe the way people act and you sort of think, oh man, you've just like, you you haven't got to that stage where you've seen, or you've been that close to, to that sort of defining moment of, of understanding that a lot of what we're doing and the the reason why we're here is pretty fucking pointless. (laughs) Do do you sort of, has it it sort of changed the way you look at the people, other people's behavior? Um, A little bit. Yeah. But I think I'd kind of already had sort of similar, similar kind of views for a, you know, a long while, like done a lot of psychedelic drugs in my time, which, you know, the whole ego death of that, Mm. you know, going through those experiences in my early twenties, that definitely sort of made me take a look at people around me a a lot and sort of just be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, don't you realize this is it? Um, but yeah, so the, the, then the the seizure experience just really enforced that. And I think, um, I see lots of, lots of people that, uh, and I see it in myself with some things as well and how I was living before this and just you kind of always changing the goalposts and, you know, moving your, your dreams kind of further away so you can keep doing this job or keep being in this relationship or not upsetting this person or something and just sort of not being willing enough to take that sort of step out of your comfort zone to kind of get to where you actually want to be. Did Did these types of experiences... Oh, it's probably a mixture of everything, but, uh, did it, did it sort of shift life into a more exciting direction? Sort of, especially when you start to have a little bit more assurance about, <laughs> about your future, but you know, did it, did it sort of reinstate sort of, you know, that what you've got, you know, it, a lot of it is in your control when other things aren't, um, as opposed to other people that sort of sit back and they blame everyone else around them and their environment and their circumstances, but don't actually take the initiative themselves. Did, did did you sort of come out of some of this with a little bit more, oh, I'm just trying to think of something that's le- that's less cliche than a new lease of life, you know, but if you know <laughs> what I mean anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think uh, initially as well, like when I was writing that song, there wasn't necessarily the, the view of that I was going to, you know, be coming out of this stronger and better or that there was, I, I didn't know what was next, you know, like, even though the, the risk was, you know, pretty pretty low, really, some of the best surgeons in the world sort of worked on my head. There's still, you know, this chance of when you get your your brain cut open that you might die on the table, or you might they might mess something up and cut the wrong nerve or something, and you're permanently disabled. Or I, like, 
cancer could have been could have turned out to be a really bad cancer that you know was a bit more widespread than they realized and inoperable or whatever so there was a fair bit more bleakness to it at the t- at the time but it was still kind of there's still you know there's still like a message of hope in it like because it was like hey I might die or something might might go this might go real bad but it's it's not happening yet so yeah uh I don't know if that <laughs> no definitely i mean it's even for me like it's it's I guess you can't you can't relate un- unless you you go through it yourself, and so you can only really be an observer and sort of take it in and sort of try and interpret it uh, the best that you can. Because you know, if I think of whatever adversity I've gone through in my life, you know, it, you know, you always compare to other people. And for me, I've I've been I've been really fortunate in in the grand scheme of things. But um, I think you try and take messages out of other people's experiences just so you can not go off track or not do make silly decisions, you know, whatever it might be, you try and learn from other people's uh, hardship. But I think that's one of the things that's been kind of cool work with, you know, being connected with you for a while now. And I think you're probably one of the more, one of the more, or if not one of the most vulnerable people publicly <laughs> that I know. And I mean, that as like the biggest compliment possible because, you know, whether it be on Twitter or whatever, it's just, you know, you, you sort of talk, you know, with with commentary based off what's what's going through your mind at the moment, how you're feeling, and even in your music and putting out the EP. I mean, it's it's pretty fucking raw stuff, you know. But uh, a lot of people yeah. would rather be a little bit, uh, you know, throw a few more metaphors or be a little bit more cryptic with, uh, you know, their messages or how they're feeling. And I think for you, you're sort of like fuck it, like just let's 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 pour it all out and. That's it's kind of refreshing for the rest of us, I think. I mean, you know, none of us want to go through what you're going through, but um, it's kind of nice just to see somebody that's strong enough to be able to go, you know what, fuck it. Like, I don't, I, I don't care. At least that's the, perce- the perspective I get anyway. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's necessarily something I, I'm not sure if it's something I worked for or not, but um, I just think that's kind of how I am. I just like to express myself emotionally and I, I like to say things as, as they are, call things as I see it. It really sort of, uh, you know, as you're sort of referring to my tweets and things like that, like especially when it comes to politics and stuff, just seeing people just be like nice and polite in the face of pure corruption and like pure evil and just just how there's, I feel like sometimes surrounded by people that just play the game rather than just saying, hey, that's bullshit, or hey, this is how I actually feel, and that uh, maybe it's just because that's, it's, you know, not how I am, but it, I find that frustrating a lot of the time, and I want to be the antidote to that in some ways, or at least show people that uh, it's okay to be the antidote to that mm. and to just just be real. It's not something that's as common as we'd like it like it to be. I mean, I, I mean, just even sort of me, sort of going through my own identity and changes that I've had throughout my life. It's you know, it's sort of one of those male-dominated things, especially in Australian culture, where you you know you, you keep things bottled up and you don't really talk about things too much, and you know you, you don't want to don't want to show too much vulnerability because uh, then you're weak. You yeah. know, that they, those those usual stereotypes that have sort of infected infected a lot of. Uh, the generations before us and even our generation yeah, to I, agree. I see that I see that in my father and he's ended up pretty miserable. So mm. why would I want to be like that? Like he's kept everything bottled up forever and it hasn't led him to a good place. And I've kind of always sort of saw that that was perhaps where he was going. So maybe that's had part of something to do with it too. Have you found that when like even though you, you're not consciously making the decision, I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to put myself out there. I mean, it's natural. It's natural for you to to be doing what you're doing. But have you found that when you've thrown yourself out there and you know made a comment or a statement or just expressed how you're feeling about something that you've you've uh, tested what you thought were friendships that you had with other people around you? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, for sure. But I um. I also don't necessarily feel it doesn't make me feel vulnerable. Like if it, if it looks like that to you, then I understand, but it makes me, it doesn't make, give me a sense of vulnerability when I express myself or give my opinion on something on the fly. 
it kind of um, makes me feel empowered more than anything. Mm. And uh, yeah, like I don't know, in terms of reevaluating friendships and stuff, uh, this year has been a big, a big one for that. With uh, just everyone having all their opinions about the way things are with the virus and every and the lockdowns and everything in particular, like that's that's really made me reevaluate a lot of friendships. But um, before that, not really. I think it. Uh, I don't think um, I had. I think most of my friends, you know, for the most part, most of my friends are on similar, pretty similar pages, or at least understanding pages with how I sort of see the world. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I've lost a bunch of friends or lost a bunch of respect from people over the years for just saying shit. Like sometimes I'll, I'll totally accept that sometimes I offend people without meaning to, or without, you know, really thinking my comments through. I think I'm getting better at that and better at judging things and being more empathetic as I get older. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the vulnerability thing, and my interpretation of it is probably because if I was in your shoes writing similar things and I think that the fact that, and it's not so much about the political stuff and that sort of, I mean, that's always going to be polarizing for all sorts of different reasons because just the way that we're set up as a society. But I think just the, when, when you're talking about just how you feel about a situation or, you know, how you're impacted emotionally by things. And I think when you're writing like that, I think that's something that for me, I look at it and I go, wow, like I can relate to a degree on a basic level, not on a deep level, but if I was in your shoes, I don't know if I could do that. And I think that's when my interpretation right. of it is that it's, that it's a vulnerable thing. Whereas for you, as you said, yeah. It's just you putting it out there. It's not so much, oh, shit, oh, can I do this? You know, I'm just going to put it out and cross my fingers. Yeah. Uh, someone's going to tease me for being yeah. an emo, whatever. <laughs> Happened anyway. <laughs> Back in the Brisbane old days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I was talking to Sam Alcock the other day, actually. I haven't yeah. caught up with him in a while. Oh, man, he, he was mentioning some funny stuff. I don't know if it's necessarily podcast appropriate to uh, start <laughs> – saying what Sam Alcock's being saying, but, um, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, had some funny trivia to report about our fellow bris metal users. Oh, or right. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, feel, feel free to, uh, if you don't want to name names, of course, but, uh, you can certainly, I don't give a shit about the listeners. I'm now I'm curious about what people have been up to. <laughs> uh, he's just talk he was talking about one of the guys from Thorn Valdehine or, or whatever that band was called oh, yeah. and how he, he'd turn into a, like a, 100% like Sig hailing Peter Credlin stand. Wow. And it was pretty amusing. We had a good chuckle. Wow. There you go. The <laughs> <laughs> the days of our lives of the Briz metal scene. There you go. Yeah. Wow. That was, I mean, that, I think we spoke about it last time we did a podcast about Briz metal, uh, but that was like an institution for, for a lot of us sort of getting, getting our grasp of the local scene and, and, uh, mm -hmm. sort of getting, getting friends and little cliques and the internet and this forum was just a, it was, it was a pretty toxic place, but at the same time it was, it was really entertaining. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of drama that came out of that forum. Yeah. Like most, I think, uh, internet forums or music internet forums I was involved in during that era, like they're all the same. Um, because I was on, you know, a couple of punk and hardcore ones as well. And just, there was always so much, uh, so many great friendships and great experiences that came from them, but a lot of ridiculous drama and just defensive stuff too. Good times. It was, it was. <laughs> Some of it, I hope people forget, especially shit that I've said over the years, but um, yeah, it was a lot of fun <laughs> at the time. No, I, um, I, a few years ago, had had my friend that ran the site to delete my entire profile of the noise theory web forum because I was just like, I probably said some absolutely crazy sh cancelable shit. Like when I was, well, I know I did when I was like, you know, 18 and around there or whatever, especially when I was a teenager, like some of the stuff on the internet that I would have said, or some of the insults I would have thrown at people, like the drama I would have caused, like shamed. I'm ashamed by some of it, to, you know, <laughs> if I'm being honest, looking back and, just had to kind of try and wipe that slate clean a bit. 
I just, think Brisbane has actually gone too. So yeah, I think that's gone. I, I tried looking for it uh, a few months back, and I don't think I don't think there's uh, anything left. I think there's a there's a little Facebook group where they they a few people have tried to recapture the vibe, and uh, it's just not the same. So I think people just need to let it let it die. <laughs> Yeah, it's just face, Facebook uh, ruined uh, internet forums, really. Probably for the best, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we sort of got it all out of our systems. Oh yeah, I think early um, on. I think I think it uh, extinguished a lot of my edge lord uh, tendencies, where uh, similar to you, just sort of yeah, insults and comments purely just to like just to stir the pot and just try and be as edgy as possible, and uh, you know. It's a, it's definitely a, a big uh, adrenaline kick at the time, but yeah, in hindsight, so <laughs> years and years down the track, it's probably not something you want to to pop back up again. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so everyone listening now, <laughs> go and find our stuff on on the internets in the uh, online forums <laughs> and uh, share share with uh, what you can find. No, please don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cancelled. Yeah, cancelled. Yeah. Uh, speaking of edge lords, I'm I'm really. Um, loving your deep dive into the tinfoil hat brigade uh on on facebook and uh on twitter i think just i mean i i don't understand why you've decided to even amuse yourself with a lot of these uh these conspiracy theorist groups because i just given everything that you've gone through over the past uh however long um this would probably be the last sort of bunch of people that you'd even want to know exist so um <laughs> yeah, it's um well, like I've, I sort of find it upsetting when uh, friends of mine have fallen into it or reveal that they're into it or whatever. But when it comes to perhaps uh, strangers or or whatever, I kind of get a kick out of just looking at what all the freaks are saying and all just like it's it's like bad. It's just it's bad comedy, but it's real. Like um, it's, it's just like a, a yeah bizarre online reality show of this all these people living in this alternate alternate dimension in their own heads and i love that there's just no unified consensus on what the actual conspiracy behind everything is it's like everyone's got their own little version of the truth and they take a bit from this one or take a bit from like that conspiracy or and then some of them are like christians and some of them are atheists and I, it's obviously like conspiracy theorists are as diverse as the rest of humanity. Mm. And, uh, I don't know. I just find it fascinating and, and hilarious. Maybe it's punching down a little bit, but I uh, like watching <laughs> idiots. You know, some people like watching funniest home videos on the TV and watching like <laughs> kids, run, kids run into brick walls and hurt themselves or like people crash their bikes on YouTube and stuff. I just like watching people crash their brains a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all brown cardigan watchers, so really it's just an extension of that really, isn't it? it, it brown cardigan's like the uh the 2020 uh funny home video show. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um yeah, it's just just laughing at cooked units. <laughs> yeah. I guess I sort of feel sorry for him sometimes too, but um but yeah, it's like you know, it's the sort of shit where it's like if I don't laugh at this, I'll I'll cry, I'll just com completely despair at the state of the world. But if I can sort of, I'll still despair at the state of the world. But if I can pull a few threads of enjoyment out of some of the really bad shit that's there, like Trump's kind of possibly a, a really great example of that too. Like obviously one of the most awful fucking humans that's ever held a high position of power in the modern world, but. Uh, I still can't help but be insanely entertained by his antics. It's hilarious. Agreed. He's funny. Agreed. <laughs> he, I was listening to um, a podcast oh, yesterday, I think. Um, there's a comedian from the States called Tim Dillon, and um, and he was Is talking about the guy on the Rogan podcast with uh, – Oh, with Alex, Alex Jones? Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I watched the first 10 minutes, couldn't stomach it. Oh, I've – I've downloaded it. I don't know if I'm going to listen to it though. I sort of went, mm, I don't know if I've got enough mental real estate to, to deal with this. I've, <laughs> I've turned off, I've turned off a little bit of Rogan, uh, you know, over the past uh, few months. So I'm really select about what I listen to on there, but, uh, yeah, Alex Jones, I just don't know. don't know if I can be entertained enough to, to tune in, but, um, yeah, it's like, I guess the, the last 
I think he's done what? That's his, his third one with Rogan now, I think. Yeah. But there was uh, the big one that he did, the absolutely hilarious one where Rogan just, I think they got high and he just let him go. <laughs> and he just was talking about interdimensional dark matter pedophiles and stuff. <laughs> and um, that was hilarious. But this latest one, I guess maybe it's Joe, because, uh, you know, Joe Rogan's copped a fair bit of criticism for just letting people come on and say whatever they want to say with yeah. and while trying to pretend that he's not a news source or something. They're trying to pretend that he shouldn't have to have some kind of responsibility for what's on his platform. Mm. Um, so he, he was, with what I watched anyway, the first, whatever, 10, 15 minutes of this podcast with Alex Jones, or at least the first 10, 15 minutes once they started getting stuck into the, um, the conspiracy stuff, uh, he was quite rigorously fact-checking him and pulling him up on everything. And that just kind of, took away the um the amusement factor for me with uh alex jones because he just kind of uh when he kept getting put back on his leash it made it less funny because just the kind of flailing madness would just keep kind of uh not really taking off uh so and it was just and but he'd kind of go around in circles with his justifications and stuff and mm. so it just wasn't fun. yeah i think it'd be a weird thing as well where by by fat Fact checking somebody like that, even though you might be dispelling some of the shit that's coming out of his mouth, I think the fact that you're even willing to fact check him sort of validates that some of the stuff that he's saying is worth saying. And I think that sort of encourages a behavior that you probably just don't want to be putting on a platform where you're getting millions and millions and millions of downloads. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's dangerous. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, a little bit, yeah. Well, uh, but uh, that said, like Trump is the leader of the free world, and he's uh, he's uh, you know, he spreads conspiracy theories and stuff too, oh, and yeah. just kind of makes up his facts. So sometimes, as much as I want the world to be a, a better and more rigorously truthful place, perhaps it's hard to kind of blame other people for sort of. Um, giving that behavior more of a pass sometimes. I don't know. Mm. Well, don't want to like completely endorse it or whatever, but uh, it's easy to see how people would feel that that is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything's gray, isn't it? It's not black and white. I mean, there's always, there's always a nuance to it and that's why things aren't just as polarizing as what they're, they're sort of promoted to be. It's either, oh, it's either yes or no. It's either this side of the fence or that side of the fence. It's just not that clear cut, but, um, the the Trump thing, <laughs> I was listening to this Tim Dillon podcast, and he said he he sort of said, "Look, he doesn't doesn't expect Trump to to win uh, this this election that's coming up what tomorrow? No, uh, Wednesday or whatever it is." But um, he sort of said, "What will what he thinks will happen is more or less he's not going to be the president anymore, and even though a large chunk of America hates him, America and especially Hollywood will completely embrace him post." presidential sort of uh, run and he'll just go on all the talk shows and he'll be this lovable character who just, you know, spins yarns and tells stupid stories and yep. he's comical and, you know, he may get a, his own reality show again and, and just go back to where he was before. And, and if anything, he's, he'll, he'll have this laugh to say, basically, look what I've, look what I managed to do. And I'm still the greatest because, you know, here I am this, you know, tycoon, um, uh, reality star, you know, property mongrel sort of thing. And, uh, and now here, here I am sort of, uh, leader of the free world and, and, you know, I did it. So suck shit, you know, that sort of thing. And, and everyone's yeah. just sort of yeah. going to give him this warm embrace and say, oh, well now you're back in the safe space. So we're going to, we're going to, uh, prop you back up and, and make you feel special. And it's just, it was quite well, amusing the way he explained it. Yeah. I, um, I suggested a couple of months ago, perhaps that, uh, I could see him becoming a Fox News host. <laughs> yeah. Like he's, if he doesn't, uh, and even if he does get convicted of some criminal doings, he will probably we work his way out of it eventually somehow. And even if he does get a conviction, like it's not going to stop him from still being like one of the most famous people that's ever lived and having a, a flourishing media career in the divided states of America as it kind of slowly burns to dust. There is, <laughs> there is no way that he will just 
vanish into obscurity, into the darkness, and and everyone will be like, oh, whatever happened to to Donald Trump? It'll be he'll. There's no way that America can forget about him, and there'll be people out there who will just be looking to capitalize on him, and he'll be ready to capitalize on himself. It's just there's just no chance. No chance he's gonna just slowly fade away. He's gonna he's gonna burn out <laughs> until the very yeah. end. Uh, can you just imagine once the dementia starts to kind of properly kick in, <laughs> how amazing that's going to be? <laughs> oh. I really, really hope that um, I live to see that. Trump just melting down embarrassingly uh, on like live television events as like a game show host or something. It would be incredible. Oh, a game show but host would be knows? amazing. It's sort of like George, uh, George Bush who – you know, retired and started painting pictures, like just this weird, like, like, you know, he's, well, doing, he's doing what? <laughs> yeah. It was like, um, he kind of got rehabilitated by the media a little bit as, uh, not a war criminal, but just like a nice old guy that's getting into to painting. Yeah. 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 I've got a feeling that's going to be what, uh, what ends up, ends up happening to Trump as well. Um, it may, may yeah, not be I, uh, immediately, but uh, down the track, definitely, I think. Barack Obama shooting hoops and being cool and everyone saying they miss him, even though he put into place like a whole bunch of the laws that Trump is using to basically fuck America right now. Like, <laughs> it's basically the, the destiny of, of every American president is to become a legend, even if they were completely fucked. That was a pretty cool shot though. I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> it went, okay. I've yeah, got to like that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean it's scary. I mean I don't know if it's an American thing. I mean, m mind you, it's 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 the same in any well, at least most of the Western countries. I don't think any, even in, you know, from our prime ministers. I think everybody's yeah. Some of them have faded away and gone into some sort of obscurity. But I don't think I think if if that person has wanted You're talking to talking about Scott Morrison. Well, it, well, he's still <laughs> he's he's still there at the moment. So we we don't know how he's going to go post. Uh, <laughs> barely, I know. Oh, but, um, yeah, oh, yeah I, sorry to interrupt. no, no. I mean, I think, I think with a lot of them who've, who've gone through the ranks over the years, I think they've, you know, they've, they've managed to find a, a level of comfort post, uh, you know, being in, in government and have been sort of more or less left alone. And in some cases idolized as they've got into their, their, uh, elderly years and eventually passed on, you know, they've been sort of held up on a, on a pedestal despite whatever dramas and, and problems they've created for, for the country. Yeah. And, um, and you got people like Kevin Rudd doing what he's doing now and sort of using his, his platform for something kind of good again. And it's kind of made me forget about all the things I didn't really like about him when he was in office. Yeah. It's a, it's a mixture of emotions that one. Cause I was like, you know, I wasn't I was never really a K Rudd fan to begin with, but now I'm sort of like, I, I, I appreciate what he does, but I'm, I've also been sucked into his kind of cool dude sort of persona that he's put out there as well, which I know is just like, I've, yeah, I've been sucked in. I've been sucked in big time. <laughs> yeah. the Even like the 420, 69 thing. You see that? <laughs> yeah. I was just like, uh, <laughs> God, this is so shit, but I can't help but kind of like it. Yeah. Yeah. Even even him growing a beard, I went, oh man, he looks cool now. Like he he looks he looks tough. And and I think there was a picture someone put up online of like it was a Photoshop of Trump with a beard, and they said if Trump grows a beard, he's guaranteed to win the election. And they did this like you know this Photoshop, and I looked at it and went, fuck, he looks dead serious. He looks like he looks somewhat like a, a force to be reckoned with as a president with a beard. And I thought, please don't grow a beard, Trump. Please don't grow one. <laughs> uh, man, I'm I'm hanging out for um, hanging out for the election. Hey, it's gonna the internet is just going to be a wild place again. Not that it's ever stopped being wild for a second this year. No. But <laughs> actually, I saw a tweet earlier today that was like from an American, obviously. That was like, hey guys, guess what? The worst part of 2020 doesn't even begin until the next two days. Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> well, you saw the you saw the Lady Gaga video I retweeted earlier today. Oh. Like, what the fuck was that about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just broken country. Just, I don't know. Oh, just no idea. Just, it's just. 
I'm I'm tempted to just to take the day off on Wednesday and just uh, find a pub that's uh, streaming the 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 election and just uh, just make the most of it. Just just go down in flames like uh, like the globe's about to. You know, <laughs> just... right, so you've, been, you've been heading out to like pubs or, or gigs or whatever in Sydney much now. Well, you know, during this whole period where you've actually sort of been allowed to, while we weren't. Yeah. Uh, not really. I mean, I've gone to a couple of pubs, um, and I think I went through something similar to what you've been going through just recently with, um, you know, only a few days ago, sort of being allowed to really sort of venture out and do anything. Um, yeah. there's still a bit of anxiety sort of walking into places. Um, uh, you know, you've got the yeah. QR code check-in, which that threw me the first time I was so, I was about to have an, a heart attack sort of walking in because I just didn't, I was waiting to get in trouble straight away and so that was that mental hurdle i had to get over and i was just so hyper conscious of other people around and sort of watching people not social distance and just sort of wondering you know are we about to are we just setting ourselves up for another right now sorry like am i getting covid right now yeah yeah and just like are are the people around me just encouraging the potential of another you know lockdown that's going to happen because people aren't respecting it and so that stuff's been going through my head which I've calmed down a little bit more because we've sort of been sort of relatively normal for a bit longer now. So it's sort of getting better, but um, I'm still pretty, I mean, I still wear a face mask when I'm in sort of in closed spaces, but it is hard sort of when you're in a pub to, to have a face mask on or even have it wrapped around your, your your chin or your neck or anything like that. You sort of feel really, really awkward and weird. So uh, yeah, getting through that. The gigs, um, I've been to one, um, but yeah, I have not really ventured out at all. Um, and I think part of it's part of it's a bit, a little bit of anxiety around it. But um, I just, I don't know if I can sit still for a, for a gig. You know, sit sit down still and just and sit there and yeah. just watch watch bands play. And I get it. Like if you just got to make do with what you got. And I applaud like the venues who are just trying to make it happen and be creative and think outside the box. But um, yeah, it's just a struggle. Like I, I don't know if I can sit there and drink and just watch metal bands trying to thrash out on stage with zero energy in the room. It's just a, it's a really weird, it's a weird vibe. Yeah. Like there's, there's some sort of bands that I think it would be pretty cool for. Like, uh, you know, like sort of non-metal bands or like mm. post-rock, post-metal, like slower kind of like doom metal and yeah, doom. stone and stuff. Like I think that it would be sit down shows would be quite suitable for that sort of stuff. But, uh, it comes to like extreme metal and hardcore and ev- all punk rock and everything. Like, uh, I don't want to go to those shows and fucking sit down. I think, I think you just depress the hell out of me, to be honest. So, just like, I just, even for me, I think part of it is me envisioning myself being on stage, being that performer, trying to work yeah. a crowd of people sitting down and attempting to, to remain engaged throughout a, you know, 40 minute, 45 minute set or whatever it's going to be and just sort of going, oh my God, like what, <laughs> didn't we make the right decision here? <laughs> I still want Run to play gigs, but I'm not even going to bother looking at booking anything until shows are back to normal mm. because I just don't want our first show to have a fucking weird energy where everyone's sitting still and I'm trying to give it my all on stage and you can't really get much back from it except for maybe some raised fists and some smiles and stuff like while everyone's sort of sitting X meters apart or whatever. You don't want to compromise. Rather, rather not do that. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I've, I've been crapping on about, about this on the podcast a fair bit, but um, what do you think is going to happen from a touring point of view in Australia? Because I can't, I mean, I'm just watching you know, the UK and France go into lockdowns again and just like out of control. It's just, it's crazy internationally. And then the US, whatever, that, that place is on fire at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't see people traveling anywhere outside of this country, maybe to New Zealand, if we're lucky for a yeah. very, lo- very, very long time. Do you think that there might be a resurgence of like when we can actually normally gig again, do you think there's going to be a resurgence of people going out to shows and maybe doing something that's a little bit more than a Friday, Saturday night in the city only? Yeah, I think Australia is going to end up with the most healthy touring market in the world um, once, well, you know, in the in the year next year or two to come. I, I think it's still going to probably take probably another six months or or so, at least at least another three or four months, like until um, 
until we're comfortable enough to, you know, open up the borders and let everyone have free non-quarantined travel mm. between states. But, you know, as you said, everywhere else is is pretty fucked. And I think we'll be able to see that. And I think people will um, not necessarily will perhaps be more inclined to not take what we have here for granted. And I think it's going to, in a roundabout way, be really, really positive for our local scene, not only because we're going to be the only people that are going to be able to play shows and tour but and actually get to do that physically, but because the rest of the world's going to be watching as well. So in terms of the bands that are going to be the most active and successful and are going to have you know new content from gigs and stuff to be out there with all the time like the scales of attention of the attention economy are just going to tip so heavily in australia's favor that i think um, it's going to push us to like be a even much like a significantly bigger force in the global sort of music economy and the, um just the, the whole entire world of music and just just perhaps enter, entertainment live entertainment in general Australia is going to be the envy of the world for sure. Yeah. And that's something that something that's kind of uh you know really kept kept me confident and kept me believing in the, the fact that you know lockdown was the the right thing to do because now we have this uh opportunity or just we're going to have the the freedom that freedoms that and it, you know, obviously, applies to every area of, of life. But we're going to have freedoms that most people aren't, around the world aren't going to really have for a long time. I agree, man. I, I think it's going to be a case of if it's if it's if it's done the right way. I think people are going to wear wear it as a badge of pride and talk about it and be proud to be yeah. able to go out and have the the privilege to be able to do so. Whereas other people around the world just will not have that opportunity. Um, and I think. You know, just the fact that the way that people uh, have had to adjust their lives now, especially with people with traditional jobs, especially office jobs now, where many people are just working from home now, where the the concept of a school night doesn't really exist as much anymore because you don't have to worry about the, the punishing commute the next day. So people are probably more inclined to go out earlier in the week and, and have, have a chilled night, but they don't. You know, they don't have to worry about, oh, well, I shouldn't go out on a Wednesday night because, you know, I've got to, I've got to drive or, you know, sit on a train or whatever it might be the next, next morning yeah. and deal with work. Um, and I just think that it's going to change a lot of the old stereotypes around the way that we interpreted entertainment in general. Um, I think, yeah. I think the suburbs are going to come back alive again. I think with all these pubs and clubs that uh, didn't want a bar of original music at all and they were too busy worried about poker machines and all that sort of shit, um, they're going to be looking in the corners of their, their event halls and all that sort of stuff and looking for you know opportunities to put events on. So the, you like could imagine, have a... Imagine how sick it could be if like a band like Parkway Drive... Because, you know, back in the day, they used to do these like, you know, 20, 30 date insane regional tours mm. that, you know, obviously they don't do anymore. They just come and play like stadiums and stuff. But if they're not able to go and tour the states or you know tour europe as effectively like imagine like the big bands actually staying at home and doing extensive australian tours where they're on the road for a month and just playing everywhere and just playing in just you know 300 500 people or whatever if they want in like kind of whatever regional towns and stuff like i think that like i don't know if parkway could ever go back to to that level uh, but I just, I'm excited by the possibility that there's bands that are going to have to do that and have to look at just returning to, to grinding it out in Australia. Yeah. I think it, it's obviously going to be um, really fantastic in just so many ways. I'm looking forward to the Australian tour, air quotes, that's going to be more than three dates on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be, It's. I'm, I'm looking forward to those 20... 20 plus state tours where yeah you hit up the the larger regional centers and then you go out to the more sort of sparse areas around the country and just smash it out i mean we've always said it in the past Both gold coast brisbane sunshine coast instead of just brisbane yeah yeah definitely and and you can afford to do it you know and and just being able to change the narrative and the storyline around you know what what we're lucky to have, I think people are going to really sort of jump on board. But I think the big thing is that obviously the bands have got to want to do it, but I think you've got to have the infrastructure in place where you've got some really good guys who are 
who are booking shows, um, you know, and people that are aligned and working together to try and you know, build something that's bigger than just one person trying to do their own little thing. Um, there's, yeah. I mean, just even for us in Sydney, I mean, Sydney's sucked big time for, for so many years, but, you know, given the population and where all, you know, the venues have been over the years, there's nothing to stop a band doing, you know, a 10 day tour throughout the entire Sydney area, Metro and out in the burbs over a period of weeks. So there's so many places to play. And I think it's just a case of some bands are just going to have to step up and, and give it a shot and hopefully have the, a good team around them to to show everybody else how it's done and then hopefully everyone will just follow afterwards. Yeah, and I don't even think we should completely discredit um, the prospects of international touring bands coming here because obviously like the quarantine thing is, a, is an issue and it's an expensive issue, uh, but I think you'd be surprised like at the amount of bands that are probably eventually be in a position where they say, okay, we'll take that out of our payment just to come and do it, like to come and sit in a hotel for two weeks and we get to get, return to doing what we, we love on, on like the road and come and tour Australia. Like I saw Ben Collar from Converge mm. and Killer Be Killed and shit saying basically the exact same thing the other day, just like at this point I'm prepared to come and quarantine for two weeks so I can go tour Australia for a month. Yeah, that makes sense. And Hey, maybe maybe they can just do all their virtual meet and greets from their from their hotel room for two weeks. <laughs> Make some coin yeah. that way. <laughs> I mean, there's always you can always maximize that time and try and work out ways to to uh, to try and sort of mitigate those costs. And and yeah, if they if they can hit hit the road for for a solid four weeks and really sort of you know s uh, smash out some shows, then you might find that um, you know you're probably in a similar position to what we were pre-COVID anyway uh, from a from a bottom line. So it's just a case of yeah. people willing to take the risk and think outside the box. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously everyone's like, even just Australian musicians touring Australia and stuff, uh, everyone's going to have to cop it on the chin a little bit. Like flights are going to be more expensive. It's just, it's not, it's obviously not getting any easier, but um, it's, yeah, Australia's going to be really lucky to uh, have what we have if everything keeps going the way it's going Fingers and crossed. who knows maybe a magic vaccine will appear next week and <laughs> like, this will all be irrelevant in six months time but uh, <laughs> uh i can't see that happening and i kind of don't see everyone getting on board with it enough for it to be completely effective so uh we just have to wait and see we'll just we'll just keep everything locked up here as as best as we can <laughs> try and yeah. try and protect what we've got um and hopefully uh the the tinfoil hat brigade can uh, just just stay a, a safe distance. They can socially distance away from the rest of us. <laughs> it's okay to take it, admit you're wrong and take your tinfoil hat off too. And I just I can really hope more people kind of start to do that as things start to sort of um, coalesce more for where Australia's at. But again, we will see. Mm, mm, definitely. Well, on that note, mate, thanks for thanks for the chat. I'm going to chuck some links so people can check out the the new EP, the run EP. Um, congrats on it as well. I mean, fuck to, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's fucking raw. It's in your face. It's, I mean, especially understanding sort of the storyline and, and knowing a bit more about you and sort of throwing that into context. I can certainly appreciate it even more so. Um, but to, for you guys to, to churn that out through what has been just, a I can't even put into words the, the experience that you've had personally, but I, I think just even the two of you just, um, it's, it's huge, man. Congratulations. And, um, I hope more, more people get to discover it and appreciate it. And it'll lead to the next EP and, and shows eventually and, and, and the success that you hope to get out of it. Sick. Thanks heaps, man. And thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's been fun. It'd be nice to say a bunch of the thoughts I've been having lately, kind of verbally, as opposed to just in my head or digitally. Cool, cool, cool. Andy, social.net, andydowling.net. Go and check out the show notes from this episode. Reach out to Lachlan. Check out his world. Uh, you can listen to him on The Racket every Tuesday night, 10 p.m. on Triple J. Uh, he's also got his uh, his project run, of course, uh, with the with the latest EP, which is for you will never find peace within your quiet. Uh, that's runmetal.bandcamp.com. Also on Facebook. I'll have the links in the show notes, of course. Uh, you can uh, follow Lachlan on Twitter, at Lachlan Watt. That's always fun. And, um, yeah, I'll dump everything in there and go and say hi to Lachlan, go and uh, reach out, say hi, give him a little thumbs up and say, yeah, heard you on Andy social again, 
top work and go back and say that to everybody. The past 252 episodes of guests, there's a bunch of legends out there that have been on the podcast over the years, and I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Go and give them a little bit of antisocial love. I'm sure they'd be stoked to, to hear from you. Now, uh, you guys know what I'm going to say next. I'm going to plug it because I'm going to continue to plug it until my dying day. Patreon. Patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. It is a game changer for me. It is covering a lot of the costs of uh, running a podcast, and it's because of a stack of legends who have jumped on board to back the podcast through Patreon. You can join from only a buck a month. It's dirt cheap. It doesn't get you anything. It's just a little feel-good payment. It just comes out of your account each month. And uh, if there's enough of you uh, pledging, pledging a buck a month, then... Uh, then uh, that's amazing. It's it's pretty cool. But uh, there are additional tiers. You can get access to the weekly Patreon-only podcast where I do a little bit of karaoke. I talk about a Chronoplan. Oh, by the way, Team Chronoplan t-shirts available over on my Bandcamp page, so you can go and check that out in the in the show notes. Uh, if you don't know what a Chronoplan is, well, you better come over and join me on Patreon. Um, I talk about yeah, talk about that. Um, planes, trains, animobiles. I've got a segment there. Oh, I talk about weird and wonderful stories from around the world, um, and I break it all up with a little uh, little bit of. Uh, 90s TV commercials just to, you know, tick the box and get everybody happy. So really, I mean, this podcast is for everybody and it's probably one of the best podcasts on the internet. So, I mean, what more can I say? I don't think I can really endorse this podcast or a Patreon platform any more than I just did. So patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Thank you very much. And uh, a special shout out to my top tier guys, my social circle tier, tier and my, um, I can't remember what I've called the $20 tier, but something like, I think we need to talk to you which um, I never expected anybody to select the $20 tier, but uh, a couple of legends have done so. So um, just a little heads up, I am recording these outros a little bit in advance. So if you have joined uh, in recent weeks, I may not be uh, calling your name out straight away, but hang 10, it'll eventually come. But a massive thank you to Andrew from Perth, Mick G from Sydney, Ash from Daniloquin, Dan from Dapto, Rod from Rayleigh in North Carolina, Liam from Brisbane, Chris from Sydney, Brendo from Leeton, Tim from Canberra, and James from Brisbane, and also a massive thanks to Patrick from Canberra and Christian from Canberra, who are in the, I think we need to talk tier, $20 tier. I can't believe it. They're, they're, they're slinging me 20, 20 clams a month, and it's fucking huge. So thanks so much, guys, and to everybody who supports on Patreon. It's just, it's massive. It covers the costs of production, you know, things such as editing, um, hosting, uh, gear, getting around town, just all the expenses that come into running a podcast. And I've been doing that for the past five years. And it's just, uh, it's been a breath of fresh air to have uh, a little bit of that financial pressure taken off uh, the podcast. And it's opened my world up now to really be motivated and kick this whole thing up to the next level. Speaking of which, I'm almost at, at the time of recording this, uh, almost at my first goal on Patreon. And when I hit that goal, I will be upping the ante to two guest episodes per week. I've got so many people to talk to. I've got a long list of people uh, that I've written down over the years and more and more people being added all the time. I've got return guests I want to get back on and uh, there's just not enough time in the rest of my life to be able to just do one episode per week. So I'm going to up the ante, do two a week, and I'll do that once I hit that first goal on Patreon. So go on over, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling, and that'd be absolutely fabulous. Well, that's it. Uh, next week's guest, I don't know. Um, it's either going to be a musician or a comedian. Um, I haven't made the call yet as to who's going to be out next week, but, uh, I'll draw a name out of the hat. Either way, it's going to be awesome. I've got some crackers coming up uh, soon. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, until then, um, of course, take care, a uh, bit of social media love, liking, following, subscribing, go and click all the buttons on, in the player that you're using right now. Go and like, you know, if there's a little love heart or a thumbs up or a like, fucking, you know, little follow button or a subscribe button, just go and do all those things for me. You're already in there. You're in there now. You're in there now. You don't have to click anywhere else. Just go there, click on all those nice little things, and that just helps boost this podcast and make it bigger and better. I'm, I'm whacking things around here at the moment because I'm getting animated about it. The, the call to action at the end of the podcast, it's like the most important thing. This is where the most listeners are tuning in right now, my call to action. But uh, yeah, a bit of social media love. Go and get your mum listening to the podcast, your best mates. Go and uh, do a bit of uh, word of mouth. You know, There's nothing better than a word of mouth recommendation. I mean, who would listen to me? You listen to your mates, don't you? So on that note, until next week, folks, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.